That's the call to worship. <laughs> I'm a little worried about this group this afternoon. You all kind of look left wing from your perspective. There aren't any right wingers over here, but that's not your political persuasion. I'm sure. <clears throat> yeah, I know better looking at who's back over there. Hang on a second. Let's get a mic back there. Uh, coach has an announcement. I just, I just wanted to throw out a challenge to you guys. Uh, next week, uh, Jonathan Lotz, which is Danny's son, is going to be our speaker. And uh, so I'm going to throw out a challenge, which I've done before. Um, and Mickey, you'll bite into it more than anybody. He invited a, a lot of people. Well, I'm uh, Dick Knott's not been here for a while. I'm bringing him in next week. Uh, my challenge is to each one of you guys is find somebody and bring one person because Danny and Albert ran this thing together and Jonathan went through some tough times and he's in that aspect now. And I'd like, I'd love for him to see what his dad and Albert actually did. So my challenge is you guys try to invite somebody and if you can and they don't come, well, you can't help that, but try to at least ask somebody. Yeah. Hand the mic to uh, Joe back there. Share about Don. You, you had a quick visit or, what yes, today, today uh, is all about one of our very, very faithful members for many, many years, Don Marbury, uh, who's a pitcher for Carolina back in the old days and classmate of mine from dental school is in today is his 91st birthday. So, uh, I called over there this morning and talked to his wife. He's not in good health and really doesn't like to talk very much at all. So, but, uh, I called him last week just for a very couple of minutes and that's about it. He's pretty much bedridden and, uh, but I know uh, he watches uh, he watches our Zoom sometimes, and I hope he watches it today. But his ninety first birthday. Yep. Wow! Thank you. I'm going to begin with just uh, what most of you now know, and that is that uh, Catherine went home to be with the Lord on this past Sunday. Stephen Cross's wife. One of the greatest calls I've ever gotten from someone telling me that a spouse has died. Stephen called me. Uh, Sunday night and it said, Steve, my wife just ran off with another man to a bigger mansion. <laughs> and uh, we had a good chance to share. He was still uh, grateful for the love he ex was receiving here last time he was here. And as Peter will tell you, he was preaching Sunday morning at the Chinese church when she passed away. And Claire called Peter as the service was still continuing and Peter had to go up the aisle and interrupt and tell Stephen that the moment had happened. And as I understand the Chinese church did a similar thing, they gathered around Stephen and prayed. And so he's felt our love. Uh, I know a couple of gentlemen in this room were a part of the private burial this uh, morning in the drizzle and the remaining service, uh, not called a celebration of life, but a funeral will be this Sunday a Saturday over at Brian's church. Brian's one of his sons. First uh, Associate Reformed Presbyterian Church in Burlington. You can find it easily if you Google that, if you want to come. 11 o'clock. Uh, very unique, I think, to that tradition. They don't want a celebration of life. They want to focus on the resurrection. In fact, Brian told me, if you don't even mention my mother's name, the whole service, that will be fine. I'm I'm leading the service, uh, doing a little bit of, of the speaking part, a lot of singing. And to Catherine's credit, <clears throat> she watched the funeral of Queen Elizabeth and took notes and planned her own order of worship. So they're easy to follow her instructions. So if you can't be there, pray for that uh, that great worship service. And afterwards, there's a little lunch and reception in the fellowship hall and a time of sharing afterwards. That may be my toughest assignment because Stephen said, if you could, Steve, if you would MC the sharing part. I said, you know, our group, we're hard to handle. So hopefully that'll go well and we'll, we'll find our grace there. But keep praying for Stephen. Uh, one thing I might can share with you that I think has been confirmed by those who've been around him this week, he kind of goes between waves of grief and busyness of trying to manage the funeral stuff. He wants to be busy and then he wants to feel the pain. So just pray for our brother. I know he felt that last time when we were together and I know he appreciates your prayers. Let me change one thing one quick. Not uh, that you care, but I like to do little things like that. Okay. Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, on this otherwise dreary and dark day, we gather in the light of Christ, brother to brother, enjoying great fellowship and food, catching up with one another, celebrating a birthday, anticipating great times in the future, grieving with our brother and his family, all part of life. Uh, something that you haven't uh, left us unaware of. You've given us instructions in your manufacturer's handbook that this is part of life, that storms do come. And what is shown and revealed in those storms is the kind of foundation that that house is built upon. And it's clear to those who love you here, those who have followed you for these many years, that rock-solid foundation is the only way to go. And so we hope that we've established that so that whether we're coming out of a storm, going into a storm, or currently in a storm, we can stand firm on the solid foundation. Lord, I ask you to help me share just a word of encouragement this afternoon as we go into the rest of our week. May we have great thoughts that are your thoughts as you speak to us through your timeless truth. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, uh, it's interesting kind of think about what to share sometimes in the midst of challenges. We all have our challenges, don't we? Um, I have some friends in ministry who have failed, moral failure or other kinds of failure. And some of them have just drifted off into the sunset. We don't know anything about them. I've got good close friends who failed in various ways, Christian brothers in their marriage, in their finances, you, you pick the topic, they've, they've, by somebody's standard, they have failed. And so the question I have before me oftentimes, and I hope you've answered this question, is what, what happens when we fail as a Christian? What happens when we sin, not because the devil made me do it, as the theologian Flip Wilson used to say, but when we choose. And by the way, quite frankly, anytime I sin, I choose to sin, right? I can't blame anybody. Have you ever gone through a period of your life where you just felt like you've messed up and God is not in love with you anymore? He's, he's disqualified you, you as you disqualified yourself. Have you ever felt like this guy? I, I saw this picture and I thought that might describe how a lot of people feel sometime after sin. God's just ready to flip them off and say goodbye to them. You have fallen from grace as we read in Galatians. So I took encouragement from some scripture this week and thought, well, I'll talk about that in the midst of that. I don't know where your situation is. I don't know how you feel about condemnation or guilt. I think we feel that from time to time. I've told the story many times about Larry Crabb, the great Christian psychologist who had a guy come in his office for the very first visit, didn't know him, didn't even know his name, had him sit down. He said, uh, how can I help you? He said, Dr. Crabb, I feel guilty. What's wrong with me? And Dr. Crabb, not knowing him, said, that's because you're guilty. <laughs> That'll be 20 bucks. <laughs> no, we do feel that. We feel as if God is ready to get rid of us. We fail miserably. And, and what's perhaps one of the greatest failures in all of Scripture? It came right after the resurrection. You know the story. This is normally something we focus on around Chris, uh, Easter time, but I'm going to focus on it now. Uh, setting the scene, scene again, Jesus has already been crucified in the Gospels. He's been buried. The good news is he didn't stay buried very long. He was resurrected gloriously, seen by so many people. He's appeared already to the disciples twice. Remember, the first time Thomas wasn't there, he says, I'm not believing unless I can see the wounds or feel the wounds. And, of course, Jesus accommodates that a week later when he shows up. You would think this would be nothing but celebration. Everybody in the room is happy. Jesus has fulfilled what he promised and what he said he would do. But there is one guy in the room where the resurrection of Jesus poses a problem, and that would have been Peter. Why would I say that's a problem? Wouldn't you celebrate that Jesus who was the Christ and and Jesus asked Peter many times some good questions, and Peter got them right. We just think Peter would say, hey, hey, we can get, continue this now. But what was Peter's problem? You know that Jesus foretold on the night that he was betrayed. Despite the vow by Peter at the Last Supper that 
if everyone betrays you and, and denies you, I will be faithful to the very end. And what did Jesus say? It's Peter. I wish we had audio tape of that. Peter, before the rooster crows twice, you're going to deny me three times. How did that feel in that upper room? A, a great moment, poignant moment, but he's being foretold, you're going to fail. Very specifically, you're going to fail. Well, you know the story. He follows Jesus into the courtyard. By the way, if you ever go back and read that account again, read the part that says, he followed Jesus from a distance. Can I just say, this is a sermon for another time. I won't take time to preach it, but when you follow Jesus, don't follow from a distance. It always gets you in trouble. And he was encountered by various people who said, aren't you one of his? Aren't you a part of his gang? Aren't you Galilean? And he got to the point where he cussed out loud and said, that's not, that's, I don't know that. man." And then off in the distance in some barnyard, this rooster crows and he weeps bitterly because of his failure. That could have been the end of the story for Peter. Peter could have been similar to Judas, who likewise had remorse after selling out Jesus for 30 pieces of silver who went back and tried to exchange that, throw that back into the temple, but they would have none of that. It even says he did such things as repent, but he lost it. He didn't quite come all the way back to, to Jesus. Peter could have been another casualty if it weren't for one thing. John chapter 21, my favorite chapter, probably in all the Bible, because Donnie, it's about fishing. If there's, not, if there's one thing that you may not know about me, well, you do know about me. I love to fish and march is the month for bass fishermen to catch the biggest female bass you can catch. Once they get up in the bed and spawn, they lose about 30% of their weight. So if you're gonna catch the big ones, you catch them now. I'm fanatical about fishing. And people in other Bible studies know that, so much so that this past Tuesday night, I was given this. This is a hand-painted, looks like a little fish, but it's a pin covered by a fin. I'll never put a hook on that. I'll always use that. I, I'm just fanatical about fishing. I just love it. And there's some elements in this story that if you're not a fisherman, you may not relate. And I'll try to bring that out as we go through there. There's some angling going on, and it's not just the fish that we're being angled, as we'll see. Story begins, verse 1. After this, that's after Peter and some others, after Jesus appeared to them, he revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, Sea of Galilee. Now, this is how he did so. Simon Peter, start counting now, Thomas, called Didymus, Nathaniel, who was from Cana in Galilee, and the sons, plural, of Zebedee, James and John, and two other disciples. I'm running out of fingers. We got eight people. They're together. And Peter says, like I say often, honey, I'm going fishing. Now, when I say that, it's just, I'm going to take a break. I'm going to go out on my boat. We're going to share in Harris. We're going to, we're going to drown some worms. We're going to see what we can do to get some fish in the boat. It's recreational. That's not what Peter say. What did Peter used to do before he was an apostle? He was a professional fisherman. And he was called out of that to leave that. Drop your nets. Come follow me and I'll make you fishers of men, not fishers of fish anymore. So to say I'm going fishing is not going in the right direction. It's what I call avoidance activity. If the elephant in the room is, Peter, you have failed Jesus, and Jesus has appeared twice in the room, there's a little nervous tension in that room. Peter probably hasn't spoken with Jesus yet. I don't know about you. If you've ever disappointed your spouse or your kids or somebody close to you, you don't look for an opportunity to be with them, do you? You kind of run and hide. And then maybe later screw up the courage to get into that relationship and say, you're sorry. So for Peter to say, I'm going fishing, is avoidance activity. Tragically, it doesn't just affect Peter. How many are with him? Seven other people. We will go with you. Have any of you learned that when you sin, sometimes it's not just you affected, but others? And they looked up to Peter in that small circle of 11 people. They looked up to him and so, hey, if Peter's going back to Galilee and going fishing, hey, let's go out there on the boat. Sound like a good deal. Notice this. They went out, they got into the boat, and when do they fish over there in the Sea of Galilee? Nighttime. Water's crystal clear. I've been there. If you're going to fish with a net, 
you got to go when it's dark 30. I catch live bait in the summertime, little thread thin shad at Sharon Harris. I got to be there a half an hour before sunrise or else they see the net coming. And I don't, I got nothing to use on my hook. Same thing in Sea of Galilee. My life goal ambition is go cast the net and see if Galilee at nighttime, see if I can catch anything. They go all night. Guess what happens at night in that part of the world? Roosters crow. You think that was a haunting memory for Peter as he listened? Maybe he summoned up the words of Jesus in his lifetime. He heard him say, apart from me, you can do nothing. And so this was a bad trip. I had one yesterday. I, I caught nothing. Well, I caught a catfish. I count that nothing. They caught nothing. Nothing. There's not a fisherman alive, Donnie, testify if you will, who ever wants to admit you got skunked. Say I caught a bad cold or I got bit by mosquitoes or something, but don't ever admit that you caught nothing. And then the sun's coming up. When it was already very early morning, Jesus stood where? He stood on the beach. Now, the very first thing I notice about this is Jesus didn't stay back in Jerusalem and said, okay, you want to go to Galilee? You want to go fishing? Go ahead. Pay your money. Take your choice. Jesus follows. But the disciples didn't know it was Jesus. We're going to learn in a minute why. For two reasons. Really, it's dark. And they're about 100 yards away. So from goal line to goal line, that's how far they were. And so visibility being what it was and sweat, eyes, and frustration of not catching anything would not allow them to really recognize this figure on the beach. They didn't know it was Jesus. So what does Jesus do? If you're trying to get a guy back into the fold who's a fisherman, you use fishing techniques to get the fisherman back. And Jesus is about to do three things that would get the attention of a fisherman. Now, you may not be a fisherman. You may be a coach. You may be a businessman. You may be retired, whatever it is. God knows how to get your attention too. But in this case, he uses fishing techniques to get a fisherman back. And the very first thing out of the gate is he asks them, have you caught any fish? Children, you don't have any fish, do you? Now, if I'm ever asked that question when I'm rolling back in at the ramp at Sharon Harris, I'm lying or something. I'm, I'm going to make up a story. I don't like to admit it, but they were honest enough. And it just says here in the, the text, a one word answer. It doesn't tell us how they said it and what other, or other words they might have added with that. It just says they replied, no, no, I don't think they said it that way. He's got their attention. Who is this guy up on the beach? Checking our live well, seeing how many fish we got. Strategy number one leads to strategy number two. He gives them some advice. I've been fishing with people who catch more than me, but my pride will not allow me to ask for their technique or their lure. And if they so happen to turn and look at me and say, well, let me how you, show you how to reel that bait in. Let me show you where to throw that lure. I, I don't like that. That's a, that's a male pride issue that I have to get over with. So Jesus does that. He says, throw your net as they're pulling it up on the left side. He says, throw it on the right side of the boat. And guess what? Even though it sun's up, even though the fish could see, you will find some. And that's underestimating what's about to happen. But he says, you'll find some. I just, I want to see this video replay when I walk into heaven. I want to see that next moment, that reaction from that boat. All it says is they were obedient, but I think there was a little caucus there in the middle of the boat at some point. Are we going to believe this guy or what? We fished all night. We know better than this guy. Who is he to tell us what to do? Well, okay. Maybe like the first time this happened previously in Jesus ministry, they say, all right, but at your word, we will do it. So that meant crowd. If, if it doesn't work, it's his fault. It just says, so they threw the net, but notice they, plural, how many people? Eight people, eight hands on the net. They were not able to pull it in because of the large number of fish. We're going to get an accurate count here in just a moment. That's why I love this story. It's a fish story. They're going to come down to details here in a minute. All we know is it's such a large number. It never gets over the gunnel. It never gets in the boat. 
the whole time. Now, suspicion grows as to who this character on the beach may be. Then the disciple who Jesus loved, who is that? John, who wrote this gospel? John, how does he always refer to himself? The disciple whom Jesus loved. Isn't that great? You refer to Judas as the one that betrayed him, but you refer to yourself as the one who Jesus loved. He's got a little suspicion. He says, we've seen this before. Who, who provided that miraculous catch of fish? He said, it's the Lord. Ding, ding, ding. We have a winner. John gets it right. So Simon Peter, who had this strange repulsion attraction with Jesus, he, he didn't want to be in his presence because he denied him. But now he says, I got to go near him. When he heard that it was the Lord, he tucked in his outer garment for he had nothing on underneath and he plunged into the sea and the Olympic event is on. He's going to outrace the boat with seven people at the oars. Meanwhile, the other disciples came with the boat dragging, see, they never got it in, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from land. Here's the accurate distance, about 100 yards. You got the scene? Now Jesus says the third thing that will get the attention of a fisherman. He provides a fish breakfast. Now, Donnie, I don't know about you, but I'm not interested in eating fish for breakfast, barbecued or otherwise. But as I heard a dear African-American brother over in uh, Greensboro when I was younger preach on this, he said, I don't like fish for breakfast. I don't know that it would taste good, but if Jesus cooked it, don't you know it was good? And I confirm. Notice what's already there. They got on the beach and they saw a charcoal fire ready with a fish with already fish placed on it. <laughs> I, I have an imagination here. I'm thinking, Jesus showed up, nobody around. He said, fire, and made him charcoal. I mean, that's hard. You know, you have to get the fire going a long time before you get charcoal. He just said, fire, charcoal. Uh, fish, have him jumping out of the water, jumping on there, and bread already. Jesus said, like he didn't say in the wilderness when he was tempted, turn these stones into loaves. Of this time he said, bread. So a ready-made breakfast is sitting there. Come, he said, uh, bring some of the fish you have just caught. So I want you to have a part in this breakfast. Bring some of the ones you caught other than the ones I've placed on the fire. So Simon Peter, this is my favorite part. He went aboard. He pulled the net to shore. That's superhuman strength. And it was notice. <clears throat> here's the fisherman. It was full of little fish. No. Medium fish. No. Big fish. No, large fish. That's a fisherman for you. Was it one or two or three? It was 153. <laughs> that would win any tournament that I know of. I'd got their attention. But notice this other miracle that occurred. It's lost in the story. 153 large fish, that would rip a net to shreds. But although there were so many, the net was not torn. That's, that's a beautiful, merciful thing Jesus said. He strengthened the net for them so they wouldn't have to replace it. So three things. He asked them, do you have anything? And that was an irritating question, but it got their attention. Sometimes when Jesus is trying to get your attention, he'll ask you an irritating question to get you a little disturbed. Secondly, he might offer some words of advice that you don't want to hear, gets your attention. And thirdly, he might feed you something you don't always want to eat, a fish breakfast. Then he invites them to eat. Come have breakfast, Jesus said. But none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Quiet. You get the picture there? It's, a, it's like the elephant in the room kind of quiet. Peter and Jesus are going to have this meeting right here on the beach. And nobody wants to break the ice. Nobody wants to comment. It's eerie. How long did this go on? We're not told. You ever been in a situation where something needs to be said and nobody wants to start the conversation? Strange feeling on that beach. So Jesus came, he took the bread, he gave it to them, and he did the same with the fish. Now, this is the third time Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. The first time without Thomas, the second time with Thomas, now the third time on the beach. 
And then when they'd finished breakfast, so they ate the whole breakfast. I don't know how long it takes you to eat breakfast, but at least a half an hour, maybe go by. Nobody's been saying anything. Who breaks the ice? Jesus. He turns to this denying Peter and he says, Simon, which by the way, it was a heartbreak the moment he said Simon, because he had been renamed Peter, the rock, remember? Because he was so strong and right when he, he confessed Jesus was, was the one that we've been waiting for, right? Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. When Jesus addresses him as Simon, he's demoted in a sense back to where he was before that initial call. Simon, son of John, just a generic name. Question, do you love me more than these do? He replied, yes, Lord, you know I love you. So Jesus said, feed my lambs. I read this wrong for many, many years, long before I could understand this stuff called Greek and Hebrew. But when I finally got a hold of some of the, the understanding of words, like the word love, it's different in the Greek. We have one word for love. I can say, I love my wife. I use the English word love. I can say, I love fishing. That better mean two different things, right? You know, in the context, what I'm talking about. The Greeks have figured it out by giving four different Greek words for love. And two of them are used here. So when Jesus says, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He uses the familiar Greek word. Some of you have heard agape. Say that with me, agape. What is agape? That's unconditional love. That's God's like love. He loves you no matter what you do. He loves you. He, he may be disappointed in some of the things I do, but he never loses the love. So that's the question, do you love me, right? What does Peter say? Well, yes, Lord, you know that I love you, but he doesn't use the word agape here. He uses another of the Greek words for love. It's the word phileo. Say that. Phileo, like filleting a fish. Phileo. What does phileo mean? It means human love, the best of human brotherly love. Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. I, I dispute that name nowadays when I go there, but... Uh, it's the best of human love, but it's not as good as agape. It's, it's limited. It's conditional. It, it comes and goes. And sometimes people say they want to get married because they have a lot of good phileo, but they really need agape. Don't you all agree with that? You got to love in spite of things when you get married. So is this a yes answer to Peter to, to Jesus's question? When, when Jesus says, Peter, do you love me like I love you? What does Peter have to say? Well, Lord, you, you know and God knows everything. You know I don't have that kind of love. You know I have this kind of love for you. Makes it different, doesn't it? It's not like some people say Jesus asks these three questions to counter the three denials, and in part that may be true, but I really think he's trying to determine where's your love with me right now, Peter? You failed me, but where's your love level? So he does a second turn of this. A second time Jesus says, Simon, again calling him Simon, son of John, do you love me? What word does he use there? He uses the same word, agape. He says, do you have unconditional love for me? And what does Peter say? Yes, Lord, well, you, you know I have phileo for you. Again, it's a no answer. Doesn't look that way in the English, but it is a no answer in the Greek. Jesus said, well, go ahead and sheep, shepherd my sheep. Twice the question, twice a negative or incomplete answer. We know he asked it a third time. What happens then? Jesus said a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Does he use the word agape here? No. Jesus dumbs down the question. He changes from agape to what? Phileo. Why does he do that? Why doesn't he just keep holding the standard high? Why don't you love me back the way God the Father and I the Son will love you? Why does he cross that out? Why is phileo acceptable at this time? But first, before I answer that, let, let me show you what happens to Peter when he hears Jesus changing the question. Peter was distressed. He knew Jesus was changing the wording. He was distressed that Jesus asked him a third time, do you love me, changing the word to brotherly love? And he said, Lord, well, you know everything. 
you know that I only love you this way. Friends, this is a beautiful accommodation by our Heavenly Father and His Son. He knows our love. As we sit here on a Thursday afternoon today, He knows what we think of Him, how much we love Him, what we're committing to do for Him, how we're saying thank you with the rest of our life for the salvation we've received. <laughs> we're not informing Him. Jesus didn't need the answers here. He knew the answers. He wanted Peter to hear his answers. But more importantly, he wanted Peter to hear his third question. Because in that, the Lord is saying, you're not there yet, but I will take you from where you are, and I'll lead you to where you need to be. It's one of the greatest things about our Lord. He doesn't force us to come up to him. He comes down to us. That's the whole story of the incarnation. Feed my sheep. But here's the most interesting thing about the passage to me. After this threefold question about love, after he's given him some instructions later to do, feed the sheep, shepherd the sheep, things like that, after he's accepted him at a, a less than complete form of love, he says this, I tell you the solemn truth, Peter, when you were young, you tied your clothes around you and you went wherever you wanted. But Peter, when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and others will tie you up and they will bring you where you do not want to go. What's he saying? Well, John tells us, Jesus said that this to indicate clearly by what kind of death Peter was going to glorify God. What did he say? Peter, when you're young in your faith, you, you had freedom and you could do what you wanted to do. But since we've been reconciled here at the beach breakfast with fish, and since now we're restored in a relationship that I've wanted more than you've wanted, you're not going to stay there. You're going to be so faithful, so committed, that when finally in your final days and you are martyred, you are going to stretch out your hands. That's a symbol of a cross. And they're going to tie you up and put clothes on you like they did Jesus when they put a robe and a scepter in his hand. And they're going to lead you up where you don't want to go, which would be a place of crucifixion. You are going to die a martyr's death in honor and respect for who I am, G Peter. That's where your love is going. It's here now, but it's going there. All because Jesus already had love for him to bring him back. Make sense? And then these last few words here, don't miss them. Jesus, after saying all this, said, Two words that I counted in the Gospels, Peter has heard 14 times. Follow me. Define Christianity in two words. Following Jesus. That's all it is. Wherever he's going, we follow him and we go. And, and Peter wasn't specifically told that. He heard Jesus say that to other people at different times. But here again on the beach, late in the game, he has to hear it again. How many times do you and I have to hear that? I'm on about 2 million at this point. Why? Because I don't follow him. I get intimidated by a little girl in the garden who accuses me of being one of his, and I deny him. I run scared many times. I live in a world like you do that's upside down and crazy and doesn't exalt our Heavenly Father and calls evil good and good evil, and I don't stand up for that, and I'm not following Jesus on that moment. I need to hear Jesus say to me every single hour, follow me, follow me. I'm leading. I'm not leaving you. I'm still here. In fact, I'll come find you if you're not following me, as is this story. Peter, we know, was indeed crucified, and he asked out of honor and, and reverence for Jesus that he would be crucified in a different way than Jesus. He asked to be crucified in the most humiliating fashion upside down, and records show that he was. So I'm going to leave you with three things for our discussion now. What does this tell me about the love of God? If you feel like he's ready to get rid of you because you fail, take heart. John 21 gives us three beautiful illustrations of the love of God. First of all, his love is proactive. What does that mean? It doesn't wait. It's not reactive. It doesn't wait for me to go to him. It comes searching for me. 
Those guys had gone a long way away from Jerusalem, all the way to Galilee, had gone away 100 yards or more from the shoreline. They were as far as they could be from Jesus because Peter wanted to run and hide. And Jesus could have stayed where Jesus was in the resurrected form, but instead he proactively got out there on the beach to prepare this reconciliation. Don't think if you ever run from God that he's going to say, well, Steve, you paid your money, you made your choice, I'm, I'm here if you need me. Story of the prodigal father, prodigal son, and the, and the father, you know the story that when he finally did come home, he jumped, the father jumped off the porch and ran, as we've heard. It's proactive. God's been called the hound of heaven, always sniffing and searching. A second thing this story tells me is Jesus' love is unilateral sometimes, one-sided. When we're not loving, Jesus is loving. When we're not enraptured with our heavenly father and seeking to serve him, he's enraptured with us. We are, as one guy said, we are God's refrigerator art. You know what I'm talking about? You got grandkids or kids and they, they squirrel some crayons across a piece of paper and it doesn't look like much. And they, God puts it up on the refrigerator with the magnets and said, that's my boy. One-sidedly, that's the one I'm proud of. I imagine God's bragging on each of us as we're up there now. I think when we get into heaven, he's going to brag, at least in that one form, we all hope to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. God's love is proactive and it's unilateral. And as we've seen here, it is most unconditional. Now, I know I, I have categories of sin in my mind that if I were to do them, that would be the condition that make God turn his face away from me. You may have some of things like that. You may know Christians who have failed, as I do. I have minister buddies who are no longer in the ministry because of horrible things they've done. And church people, Christians have said, you're, you're forsaken. You, you're lost. You, you probably never were a Christian. They said horrible things about them. And maybe in some cases, deservedly so. But my, my friends, they, the God we know is unconditional. If that were not true, we never would have gotten in in the first place, right? His love is proactive, it's unilateral and unconditional. So here's what I wanna wrap it up with. Jesus will take you and me where, wherever we are on this Thursday afternoon, wherever you are in your love relationship with him, he will take you from where you are and he will take you where he wants you to be, as he did with Peter. He's not happy for you to stay exactly where you are. He wants to move you. For Peter, it would be a martyrdom that he would suffer at the hands of the Romans. Yours will be different. Where are you today? Where should you be? I remember an old Ziggy cartoon. Remember Ziggy? He was standing in front of a map one time, and it had a little X, and it said, you are here. And way up at the top was another X that said, you're supposed to be here. And I'm sure for each of us, that's true spiritually. We should be somewhere else, right? God will take us there. That's a big talking point from this. But the last one I want to share with you is this. You are either in two conditions this afternoon. You are either following Jesus to the best of your ability right now, or Jesus is following you like he sought out those guys on the beach, like the hound of heaven, he's seeking you out. If you and I stop following him, he's, he's not giving up. He's, he's tracking us down some way. He may ask us three questions. He may ask us, have you caught any fish? He may give us some advice. He may provide a fish breakfast or some other sort of questioning or attention getting device. He has a two by four that he will put across your frontal lobe to get your attention. So if you want to avoid that, Follow me, he said. Lord, I am so grateful. My friends and I have learned the hard way that your love is ever flowing on our account. It's a river that never runs dry. We need very much to have you in our life. We need very much to stop running from you, going fishing 
and settling in for the long haul in our love relationship with you. So help us, Heavenly Father, as we talk about this for the next few minutes. To really see some application in our life, how we can better follow you, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, fishermen. What are your thoughts about John 21, what you've been listening to this afternoon? Uncle Joe. I, uh, uh, a while ago, I mistakenly uh, forgot to offer uh, our consideration and love for other two very close friends of mine are very ill, and one of them is Bob Thomas, classmate of mine from dental school, who lives down in Ramsey, who's in the hospital now. But he has a history of fishing. I mean, he's fished up and down rivers, get off the yeah. one end, and just, and he can't do it any longer. He really is very sorry of that. So that's, that's, he's, he, I, I, I send him the message. I hope he watches the, the service today because he'll love the part about the fishing. I'm going to see him as soon as I leave here. And the other one is, is, is a good friend, Ron Link, who's quite ill with cancer. Ron was in the law school and he was, I think he was probably dean of law school for a short while, but, but he's really quite ill now. I'm a wonderful Christian person. And um, so if our prayers could be with him, I, I'm not sure about Ron. Ron's a tennis player and a golfer, but I'm not sure about his fishing abilities. But it's a wonderful story. And I love the, I, I, you know, I never heard the different meanings. I knew about the different meanings for the word love. I didn't realize how you define it. That's beautiful with the different kinds of love. And then Jesus comes down. I mean, that's, that's unbelievable. That's so good. Hey, I didn't get my, I didn't learn my Greek like you did. You've now seen the extent of my Greek knowledge. Uh-huh. That's what you learn in cemetery, uh, seminary. Great, great lesson there, Steve. Um, one of the things you kind of pointed out is, you know, how far will Jesus go to come after you and follow you? Uh, I'm reminded of, uh, most of you might have seen a, a little kind of a, a depiction drawing or something that shows a picture of, Jesus in this boat and he's got a life preserver with a rope on it in his hand and and in the air and and Jesus throws him the life preserver and and pulls him in and the guy kind of helps himself that's a very very wrong picture of what we really experience and what's going on uh that's a that's a that's a man's desire to be part of uh, what it takes to be saved. The better picture is your lifeless body floating face down in the water, and Jesus pulling the boat up close enough to where he can slip his arms up under you and drag your lifeless body into the boat. That's how far Jesus will go. Well said. Any other thoughts? Michigan, I figured Michigan had something to say. It's so cold and snowing. Yeah. What's up there? Always do. Yeah, it's always a wonderful story, fishers and men. Um, it's a glory to hear that. Um, I just, you know, the plea was made out by the coach to draw in more. And I'm very thankful that I came to Chapel Hill not that long ago, and I was brought to this meeting. And here I am back again, and I, I just, you know, I feel so close to the brothers. Um, I don't hardly know any of you, but I, I get to know you. You get to know me, and I was very heartfelt by Steve Bratz and his wife. But you know what it reminded me of is he lived a life of having a companion that he could share God with and love the Lord with. And that's what I have for 58 years. And I think that's a blessing. And the memories there outweigh um, the loss. It's never a loss. And I, I love the way they're handling, handling wrong word, uh, the way they're presenting um, the death of Catherine. Uh, she didn't die. Uh, it's a resurrection. And this is a one, listen with these people here not people, brothers of mine, are. They're God-loving people. And that's what draws me um, so much. This is one of my favorite. I do a lot of Bible studies, um, but this is one of my favorites because Steve, everybody, they give such a message. And it's not just about um, 
God even, sometimes it's about sports, which I'm sure the coach enjoys just like I do. Um, it's, it's just a wonderful group. And I'm so grateful for the Lord um, because every morning I wake up, I breathe because of him. And I'm here today because I breathe through him. And I, I caught up with Bill Lamb. I'm 79 now. But we both have young minds. And we're going to live forever. <laughs> right, Bill? <laughs> he said amen. What a great, wonderful day. Amen. We're glad you survived the blizzard. I just want to, just want to tell um, th that uh, uh, we saw, my wife and I were watching some TV today, and there was two children that were mauled by dogs. One was a pit bull mastiff mix, and, and I started talking to her about uh, what you did. And I'm, I'm glad that uh, the Mastiff didn't win <laughs> that you did. So thanks for being a but good you know, it, wrestling man. It, on that. it took two hall of fames and wrestling my whole life is Greco Roman is the only reason, but the real reason was God's strength that he gave me at my age. But, you know, like I've always said, I, I trained for that for, oh, 50 years in my business. Because I went into people's homes. I just don't ever let your dog bite me. And it never happened to when. <laughs> wow. It took a long time that I could prove that God's strength can carry me through anything. And I'm a parterre wrestler. And if I had be a standing wrestler, I don't throw that well. Just a headlock. But I tell you what, I'm a really good at parterre. Because um, in judo, that's what how I beat judo people was being in parter, and that's how I beat the dog. I was in parto tear. Nobody fools with me. You know, I put, uh, um, who was it, um, Rudy Williams in the Hall of Fame, um, because I got in there before he did. And he said to me, he says, Eric, you know, I've, I was six-time national champ, but you know, I've never wrestled anybody in my life with as strong a grip as you had. And you know what? That dog found that out, and they had to shoot him to put him down. So praise the Lord for stepping in and making him, me his servant, because thrice fold, I will always serve my Lord because I'm a steward. Amen. How old was the child that the dog attacked? About 185. How, how old was the child that the Two dog years old, two and a half. And he doesn't, you know, it'll take him years of surgeries. They spent nine hours. They flew him into uh, Ann Arbor Hospital, and they spent nine hours on him. But it'll never be the same. And that's the sad part. But he, he's still alive. And his parents definitely will raise him up in God. And that's what's most important to me because he came, the young boy came from a, a Christian family. And that's why I knew the boy. And that's why I ran on it because... Um, and I knew the dog too, but I just didn't know the dog had changed temper. Um, so a quick experience, but God, I'm so grateful for you. We've just, we've all in the room taken notes to never try to wrestle you, Eric. Uh, <laughs> it's a losing proposition. Yeah. I wouldn't tackle with the coach. You know, the coach and I were in the same weight class. Basically, we never ran up against each other. And I'm glad I didn't. You know why? I didn't become a freestyle wrestler. You know why? I couldn't beat Dan Gable. And I don't think I could beat Coach Lamb. So I turned to Greco-Roman. So you avoid sometimes those powerful people. And Bill Lamb is a powerful man in all his traits in life. And he's a brother. Believe me, he's a brother to be admired. All right, we've got a plan. It's next time you're here, we're going to have a, a cage match between you, <laughs> you and Coach Lamb. No holds barred. Winner take all. We'll see. Yeah, 30 second matches. <laughs> see, I just wanted to say one thing about the left side of the boat and the right side of the boat. This is one of a few other situations in the Bible which tells us if you're a leftist, you're in the wrong place. You got to be a rightist. You got to be right minded, but you got to have this kind of right conservative attitude. That's just another confirmation. That's biblical. I don't have, I didn't add that in the Bible. This is what the Bible says. That's, that's right. I'll go with that. Well, we can pray. Uh, do we pray for the basketball game Saturday? No, we're not. 
I don't think it's going to help. I told somebody this week, I thought it was about a 50-50 chance that Carolina would win Saturday. But now that Catherine, a Blue Devil, is up in heaven, we ain't got a chance. She's giving instructions as we speak. So let's pray. Father, we are grateful that you love us unconditionally, unilaterally, proactively. And those are just three ways that we can even begin to conceive of it. Like Peter, we stray, we deny, we betray, we wander, we become indifferent, we are sometimes apathetic. None of these please you. All of these give you reason to walk away from us, except for the love of God. You come running. You come seeking and following. You're on the trail. We are in that condition today. If we're walking away and not towards you, all we have to do is look around and we'll find you. So help me and my brothers to celebrate the love that you give for us and to run toward it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.